Good evening. We'll call this 32nd meeting of the 22nd <laughs> Council to order. Uh, Vice President Winter and Councillor Sanchez are running a little bit late, but, but we will uh, have all councillors present this evening when they get here. We'll get started with a moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance led by Councillor Jones. Thanks, Councillor Jones. Parking passes for the Civic Plaza parking are provided for members of the public and you can sign up, you can obtain the pass, the pass at the sign up table from the council staff. The council will take a break approximately seven o'clock this evening if necessary. And uh, we will move forward on the meeting. Uh, we do have rules that, that uh, we started out reading these rules in, in their entirety every night, um, but I think at this point most of the folks who attend our meetings are aware of them. Um, so if there are any questions about those rules, you can certainly ask staff, but uh, uh, the most important thing is that, that we respect each other's time and not uh, uh, have disruptions or, or applause during the meeting. Um, it's really not about that with the exception of some of these proclamations where I think some very great community uh, partners will be, will be acknowledged and we're happy to, to uh, have applause during that time, but not during uh, general public comment and things of that sort. It really just prolongs the meeting for everyone. So we'll get started with some proclamations and presentations. And the first is uh, Councillor Gibson. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So we have, I don't know if they're all here, but I believe Laura Steele is here and possibly Lucas Bell Doreski and possibly Charles. There's Charles. If come on like down to, come to down. the podium. I like to present this proclamation to these folks for organizing uh, an event that's going to be happening on Saturday. This is the March for Science, and they've put a lot of work into this, and you know, and, um, I've sat with them a couple of times, and it's really, I've had a lot of fun and really enjoyed it, and I hope that you, that you have as well, and I just want to thank you for, for uh, putting this together and for all of your efforts. So I'll read the proclamation, then if you'd like to come down later, or uh, in just a moment. Council of the City of Albuquerque on April 17th, 2017, whereas the City of Albuquerque wishes to acknowledge that science protects the health of our communities, the safety of our families, the education of our children, the foundation of our economy and jobs, and the future of the world for coming generations. And whereas science helps us better understand our world and the human condition, and whereas the science serves the common good through innovation, critical thinking, and independent research. And whereas we wish to acknowledge and commend that the responsibility of scientists must be uncompromisingly to their profession and to producing knowledge. And whereas we wish to protect the rights of every person to engage with, learn from, and help shape science. And whereas we wish to prevent the suppression of scientific findings, and reaffirm the principle of open communication of scientific findings to the public and policymakers. And whereas we wish to encourage the development of future generations of scientists, and whereas the city of Albuquerque will join national partners in the observance of March for Science Day in the conjunction with Earth Day to help awareness of the importance of science and environmental literacy. Be it proclaimed by the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, that April 22nd, 
2017 is March for Science and Earth Day. The Council calls upon all Albuquerque citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, and schools to increase public understanding of the importance of science to build a better, more informed society. So thank you. Would you, do you have any words, anything you'd like to say? Short statement? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Councilor Gibson and your amazing team. And thank you, uh, thank you city councilors and the city of Albuquerque for being advocates for science. And I'm just gonna steal a few words from our statement of purpose. March for Science Albuquerque champions robustly funded and publicly communicated science as a pillar of human freedom and prosperity. One of our goals is to educate the public on the role of science in daily life, as well as the need to respect and encourage research that provides insight about the world in which we live. We are excited to highlight and advocate for the amazing science and education that is happening all around the great city of Albuquerque and New Mexico, and we want to thank you all for being a part of this endeavor. So, anybody else? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Come on Thank down. Thank you. Councilor Gibson, I was going to ask, um, do we get the details on the event on Saturday? Yes, Maybe I, we could repeat the, that. I, I should have mentioned that. So there will be a rally at Civic Plaza this coming Saturday at, I believe it's 1 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Oh, thank you for correcting me. It's 2 o'clock at Civic Plaza this two, Saturday. 2 o'clock Civic Plaza on Saturday. Okay, right. great. And um, thank you for that proclamation. It's really important. I have it on my calendar, so I should have known off the top of my head. But, but uh, all right, we'll see you there. Um, so, uh, Councilor Sanchez was going to uh, read the proclamation for uh, recognizing Alex Romero for his retirement from the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but in, in Councilor Sanchez's absence, we will, uh, uh, Councilor Pena is going to read that proclamation. Alex, please come thank, on down. Thank you, Mr. President. And any of your friends or family, want, if they want to join you, they're more than welcome to come up. But um, so Councillor Sanchez wanted me to relay a message that he really wanted to be here to read. We were going to um, read this proclamation duly, and I'm sure other councillors uh, would um, want to contribute in the, in the same fashion. But as you know, it's D-Day in terms of taxes, so he's knee deep. And I think he's going to be here shortly, but he, he's not here yet. So anyway, with that, I will get started. Um, whereas, after 12 years of exemplary service, Alex O. Romero, the president and the chief executive officer of the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce, has announced that he will retire on April 28, 2017. And whereas Alex O. Romero previously was the executive vice president of the Bank of Albuquerque and served as a board, uh, as a board member and chairman of the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce Board, during which time he was instrumental in raising funds to build the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce and its present location on Barelas. And whereas under the leadership of Alex O. Romero, the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce became the largest chamber of commerce in New Mexico, the largest Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in the United States, and was awarded the Hispanic Chamber of the Year 2014-2015 by the United States Hispano Chamber of Commerce. And whereas through his role with the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce, Alex O. Romero has um, established productive working relationships and great friendships with elected officials and staff in the city of Albuquerque and throughout the state of New Mexico. And whereas Alex Oromero has served and chaired many boards and commissions during his 57 years of employment at the Bank of, Al um, Bank of America, I'm sorry, and the, and the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce and is extremely involved in education for our students in New Mexico and proud of his effort in helping pass and work on the Hispanic Education Act. 
And whereas Alex Oromero has dedicated his working years toward helping others become successful, whether on a personal basis or through mentoring individuals and businesses. And whereas Alex Oromero grew up in Ranchos de Taos and is a proud father of four daughters, a proud grandfather of four granddaughters and one grandson, and has raised his family to be grateful for the gifts that they have and to be mindful of their heritage. Be it proclaimed that the City Council, the governing body of the City of Albuquerque, hereby thanks Alex Oromero for his dedication to the community of Albuquerque and the state of New Mexico and congratulates him on his retirement. Thank you. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Alex, uh, you can speak for no longer than 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so having worked with uh, Mr. President uh, over the years, uh, I'll be brief this time. Uh, thank you, and uh, counselors and Councilor Pena. Uh, appreciate that very much. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's been a, an, interesting, an interesting journey, and uh, <clears throat> I am so proud to uh, have worked with all of you uh, over the years and um, and those uh, that came before you in, on this council and uh, having served in, in various capacities. Uh, I was thinking back, I think it was uh, uh, Mayor Saavedra that appointed me back then to chair the Albuquerque Development Commission. And so we got to see a lot of the downtown redevelopment, those projects, uh, Mr. President, that you and I are working on today even. and. Um, and it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Uh, I arrived uh, here from Rancho de Taos at the uh, young age of 18, some 50 some years ago, and downtown was where the action was. Uh, took a Continental Trailways bus from Taos to Albuquerque. Um, the bus station was on 5th and Marquette, so that'll give you an idea. Um, <laughs> uh, there was no uptown, there was no Winrock, probably not even Winrock really, but. It's been an absolute pleasure to have served uh, our community and, and this amazing city that truly is rich in the extraordinary. So thank you all for all of your work and for this recognition. Thank you, appreciate it. Alex, um, I, <laughs> I'd probably get at least three rounds of applause, if not more. Um, also wanted to thank you for your service during my 12 years in the council on, on uh, on the Alvarado Transportation Center Task Force, which is, is one of those uh, uh, appointed bodies that, that not many people know what it does, but it does a lot of really good work, and you've been, uh, uh, you've been a guiding light on that, uh, on that group, and, and a, a, uh, obviously uh, a, a voice of, of history and understanding of how it all came about. And, and we've seen great progress there. And then also for your service on the Rail Yards Advisory Board. So you mentioned, mentioned two important projects that are in, that, that are in District 2, but um, that's just a small part, I realize, of all the volunteerism that, that you've provided and all the, the wisdom that you provided to the city over the years. So thank you very, very much. I'm grateful. Thank you so much. And uh, come on up and receive the proclamation. Thank you for doing that. I said he'd get at least three rounds of applause. He got four, so. All right. Um, we do have a presentation now that I'm sponsoring uh, from Tender Love Community Center. And Debbie Johnson, the executive director, Bill Miller and Anna Bell Garcia are here to present about the work that Tender Love does, which is really a great organization. It's uh, they're presently based out on North Forest Street, and, but uh, are doing some fantastic work. So welcome. 
Thank you so much for the, um, for the opportunity. We are so honored to be here. My name is Debbie Johnson. I am the founder and executive director of Tender Love Community Center. Our mission is to empower homeless and low-income women we, uh, through a 12-month uh, life skills curriculum using sewing as a platform. I started this uh, program based on my personal experience in homelessness. I figured out homeless people, they need more than ba daily basic needs. I am going to let my development chairman is here, and one of my board of directors is here. So my development chairman is going to tell you more about what we do and who we are. Okay. Thank you. I'm Dr. Bill Miller. I've been 31 years on the psychology faculty, and I've had the pleasure of meeting and talking with a number of you over the years. I live in Councilor Jones District now. Uh, and now I volunteer, now I'm retired from UNM, I volunteer with Tender Love and I want to tell you why. Tender Love just tries to do one thing well, which is to help women who are very vulnerable escape from poverty and that takes more than just periodic attention. Uh, it's a year-long program of, of training and mentoring uh, that really helps women establish self-supporting lives. Uh, works with mostly homeless or near homeless or low-income women. Uh, to try to help them stabilize a fair number of, of previously incarcerated women as well as uh, trauma survivors in the population. And it's been running for four years on 100% volunteer staff time. Uh, the women get a year of intensive hands-on training in uh, now in sewing, but we're looking at expanding that a bit. Nothing is charged for that. There is no tuition uh, for the program and they come away with a marketable skill in, in uh, sewing design and alterations. And also they learn employability skills as well, coming to work on time, calling if you're not going to be there and so forth. Uh, along with that, they get practical needs like food and transportation help as well. And at graduation, which is a wonderful experience, every woman gets her own sewing machine. Um, and now, uh, just as of this year, they can, if they wish, transition into uh, a business, an, a, uh, a cooperative business where they can continue working with each other uh, and uh, working on contracts. Tender Love has received several awards uh, recently and we're very happy about that. The population we serve is highly vulnerable. Everyone low income, everyone women, 91% uh, high school or less uh, education, 87% the head of household and 71% were homeless at the time that they began the Tender Love program. And it's a whole wide age range, averaging in the 40s, but all the way up to 93, 91. 91, yes, right, yeah. And very tangible outcomes. One thing that I've, I've uh, helped the center with is doing follow-up research. And so we have followed up all the women who have been through the first three years of the program. 97% of them are now in stable housing and at least 88% of them are now self-supporting. Uh, some have their own business. Um, and uh, we're very happy about that. We're very pleased when we got those figures in. Involved with a number of community partners, so we, we don't do this alone. It's good to work in collaboration with other resources. And our two-year development plan now, we hope to move to a larger facility uh, because we've outgrown the facility that we're in and to begin using the current facility to provide housing for homeless women who are students in the program because that's been a principal reason uh, for dropping out of the program that they just simply didn't have a place to live. And we're looking to expand job training into culinary arts and to elder care. So thank you very much for your time. If you wish to add something as I a board member. Hi, thank you so much. I just wanna say thank you and this program is 100% volunteer based and it's giving these women hope, uh, chances that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. So that's why I volunteer to be part of it. Looking at them, you know, excited. Sometimes they don't have a home. They create a family with tender love. So thank you so much. And thank you. thanks for the presentation. And um, uh, I just dropped in on, on, uh, on the center a, a week or so ago and, and surprised Debbie with a pile of, of alterations that I had because I can't 
though, and my wife doesn't have time to sew. So, uh, but I was very much impressed with the, just the beehive of activity there and, and all of the folks inside. And uh, uh, my good friend and neighbor, uh, Jennifer Nuanes, had told me about your program a while back and said, you've got to check this out. It's in your district and it's out on North, you're presently out on North 4th Street. Mm -hmm. But uh, as was stated, uh, uh, looking for, for a larger facility and, and we want to help with that any way we can. But uh, doing wonderful work and I'll be calling you because I, I need that uh, sports coat pretty soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Come on. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Councillor Gibson next has a presentation. Next, Councillor Gibson has a presentation from Bill Watson regarding the Albuquerque Police Department Crime Lab. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Watson, good evening, sir. Thanks, thanks for coming down. There's some, um, you know, we've been talking about uh, um, your facility for, you know, over some months now. And I guess I'm just kind of struggling and trying to figure out what kind of workload you have. And I know that you have the, the uh, SAE kit, sexual assault evidence kits. And I understand you do some DNA testing, but if I'm really um, anxious and, and happy that you're here and, and uh, uh, would like to hear, get a better idea of what all you do and how much of it you do. and and what are some of the, the barriers that you're having in getting your work done? President Benson, um, uh, Councilwoman Gibson, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting uh, me here. Uh, my name is Bill Watson. I'm the acting laboratory director uh, at the crime lab right now. Um, and I, I have to admit when I was first contacted by uh, your assistant um, to, to come down and speak, he said, I'd like you to come down and run through, uh, you know, everything the lab does and, and uh, uh, maybe discuss uh, uh, some of the volume of work that you do. And you can have five minutes. And I was thinking, well, what am I going to do with the rest of the time? Uh, but uh, it's, I have to be honest with you. I want to start out by saying there is no way that I can cover all of the, of the functions that the laboratory uh, covers. Um, and I would like to start by inviting you all to come to our facility. Uh, either individually or as a group. Um, you're welcome to come and stay as long as you need to, to stay to, to find out what it is we do and for us to be able to answer the questions that you have. So I wanted to start out with a... I'm going to move to this microphone, I think. I just want to start out with just a, with a brief overview of the laboratory. We're not actually just a laboratory. The Scientific Evidence Division of the police department covers three areas. We have crime scene, we have the physical, uh, I'm sorry, we have the uh, property and evidence area. Um, we have the criminalistics laboratory. Um, that's the civilian, generally the civilian side. And then we also have an investigative arm, um, all housed within our facility. Uh, I'm gonna focus just on the crime lab because that seems to be your area of interest. And uh, we, we break it out into two areas. Um, the first is the, uh, the phys physical investigative unit, uh, they would cover uh, things like firearms, latent prints, uh, any other controlled substances, blood and breath alcohol. Um, and then we have the human identification unit, which focuses on, I'm sorry, I said latent before. We have the human identification unit, which covers latent uh, fingerprint analysis and uh, DNA analysis. So controlled substances, I think uh, we're all probably aware of uh, what we're dealing with and con with controlled substances. Uh, in, in all over the United States. I actually came from Tennessee 11 months ago, 12 months ago, and um, we, were, we were suffering uh, many of the same uh, problems that we're dealing with right now in Albuquerque. Um, our lab 
uh, covers a number of different uh, testing techniques. We do a visual examination, microscopic examination for things like um, uh, marijuana, where we actually visualize uh, the, the fibers that are on the outside of the marijuana in order to determine what it is we're looking at. We also use color tests, which are very similar to the tests that are used by officers in the field. Um, those can provide some guidance as to what might be present, but um, there's a number of, of possibilities. So those positive results have to come into the lab for actual testing. And uh, those would include the microcrystalline tests and then GC mass spec, which is the workhorse of the Control Substances Laboratory. We actually have uh, four of them in the laboratory right now, and they're running uh, all the time. Uh, blood and breath alcohol, we actually separate this unit out from drugs. A lot of people don't. Um, New Mexico and the United States in general has a problem with uh, DWI, and our blood and breath alcohol unit, uh, which is composed of actually one and a half full-time analysts, um, currently does all of the blood and, and breath alcohol in our area, in Bernalillo County. So um, the, the most common test that we do, though, is the, the breath testing. We maintain 22 uh, testing units for the city. Uh, they're at the substations. Uh, we do have some that are held back for training and are also used, uh, the, that's the unit that you're looking at here, uh, intoxilizer. Um, we hold some back for training and then we have some that are always out being repaired uh, as you always have to with laboratory equipment. The firearms and tool marks section, um, that's the one that probably gets uh, probably the most attention, uh, maybe outside of uh, DNA and serology. Uh, firearms uh, is not just firearms, it is tool marks. We need to cover that. We've got one and a half full-time employees there and two trainees right now. Um, so we'll be fully staffed uh, when those trainees are, are done with their training. And for a firearms examiner, that can take up to two years. They, they just started within the last six months. So uh, we anticipate that they'll uh, probably vest that time just a little bit, um, but it'll still probably take uh, 16 to 18 months to complete their training. Uh, it's obvious firearms, the bullet goes through the barrel, we can match up the lands and groove impressions and the lines on the bullets and on the cases. Um, it's less obvious that you can take a screwdriver and scratch paint and actually use the scratch marks on the paint to match back to that screwdriver. So our um, firearms and tool mark section, um, they're responsible for uh, testing all of those types of cases that come in. Um, we also have a, a, a fairly well-known um, um, a shooting scene reconstruction uh, expert in the laboratory. And please feel free to stop if they have any questions along the way. I, our latent print section, um, those are the uh, fingerprints that are not obvious to the naked eye. Um, we actually have um, uh, a new PSA2 program um, that, that uh, is working hand in hand with our crime scene uh, unit to collect latent prints that are at uh, different crime scenes around the city. Um, as a consequence of that, the number of latent prints that we're getting in has increased uh, related to the, the crimes, and that's actually a good thing. Um, we do have a, a bit of a backlog in that section, um, but uh, we are hopeful that we'll have new personnel that we can train to do latent prints in the future. As part of the latent print section, we have a, a database of um, they're called APHIS. It's the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. Um, latent prints that are generated at crime scenes uh, or that are collected at crime scenes can be entered into the, uh, into the APHIS system and in fact are. Uh, we, we, sorry, we currently, uh, we currently enter in latent print packets uh, that represent all of the prints that are collected uh, at the crime scenes and um, when those hit against someone in the database, those are compared then to uh, reference uh, prints from those individuals in the, in the hopes that we can get a, a match. If I may, uh, Dr. Um, Watson, uh, so it sounds, I, I'm getting really, this is great. I understand a whole lot more of what the, the, the range and the scope of the testing that you do there. But I, I have, uh, excuse me for interrupting you, so let me understand, do you have, do your analysts or lab people, 
do they do all of these tests under the, the um, like from the fingerprints, DNA, uh, uh, sexual assault kits, uh, blood, alcohol, firearms, do they, do all of them do all of that work? Or do you have people who are assigned to certain things? It's a very good question. I've actually been in the field for 25 years. When I started, it was not uncommon to train as what we would call a generalist, right. where I might do latent print. In fact, I did do latent print analysis, DNA analysis, and I, I had some interaction with firearms. Um, now that is generally not the case, except in a few small jurisdictions. We tend to be more specialist now. Um, I, my background is DNA. I'm a molecular biologist by trade, and um, I spend all of my time, uh, well, all of my time not, not running a lab, uh, working in the DNA database. So I, I only do DNA. Our DNA analysts only do <coughs> DNA. Our firearms and tool mark examiners only do firearms and tool marks. I understand. So how many people um, do the DNA and... Um uh, sexual assault kits. Okay, so um, we're talking about the uh, forensic biology section, um, okay. and that would include serological examination, and that would include DNA testing. So we've got right now three trained analysts, and they're able to put in, I, I should say, about two and a half trained analysts that are working on casework in DNA. Um, okay. I say half because uh, Two of them split their time between training uh, new analysts. We have three trainees currently in the laboratory. Um, and we also have one that functions as the, the DNA laboratory technical leader. It's a position that's required in a forensic laboratory. So we have two and a half active analysts that are working cases right now, three training. When they're done with training, we'll be somewhere between five and six analysts. Um, and just to give you an idea of where that, that number stands relative to other laboratories, if you were to double that number, we'd have almost as many as the state lab has. So right now we have, um, uh, I, I would say we are understaffed in DNA. Um, and as a consequence of that, there, uh, it does affect the, our ability to uh, address uh, whether it's sexual assault cases, homicides, burglaries, robberies, any, any sort of case. Sure, sure. So, um, so two, the two and a half analysts almost, almost trained, correct? Um, and that once trained, they'll bring you up to five to six analysts. So um, I asked the commander uh, a couple weeks ago at our last meeting, you know, what, what's kind of the in, what's coming in and what are you getting out? And as I recalled, uh, we, and at that point, we're just talking about the sexual uh, assault evidence kits, I believe, if I'm not, not mistaken. And I believe that you said that you're getting, on an average, about 19 kits that come in, and, but you're only able to process uh, four. So input of 19, output of roughly four. So uh, is, that, is that about right? And do you have other testing? I'm sure you do, other DNA testing that you do in-house. So that's kind of what I'm trying to focus on, the input and, and you know, what's coming in, what's going out in uh, not only the sexual uh, evidence kits, but the um, uh, DNA. Is DNA like a bigger part of the pie, of that pie, or...? I would argue it's a more labor-intensive part of that pie. Um, certainly, uh, a person that does controlled substances testing uh, has a capacity, uh, potentially, to do, um, well, they, they can do hundreds of cases in a year easily, r relatively easily. Um, mm -hmm. And with DNA testing, it's more complicated. First of all, there's, there's generally multiple sample cases. Um, and Right now, honestly, the focus of the individuals that, can, that are qualified and doing testing in the laboratory is on homicides that are going to trial. Uh, we have an immediate need to test cases that are, are due in court. Well, I should say, their, their scientific evidence deadline, which we're required to meet, 
in order for their, that evidence to be included in court. We have an immediate need every month. There is our cases that are coming up for court that we have to have addressed in order for that, that uh, DNA information to be used. Mm -hmm. And until we get the staff that we need to address that effectively, it's going to be difficult to address the sexual assault evidence kit backlog that we have, which is, which is one of the reasons why we're seeking outside funding to address it. Okay. So, um, Uh, what what percentage would you say uh, of the whole? And when I'm when I say the whole, I'm talking about the evidence uh, DNA uh, samples that that you get in. What percentage of the sexual assault evidence kits? Okay, is new that? kits. New. Ki I apologize. That's okay, uh, Councilwoman. Um, New kits represent about 10% of the cases that we get in per year. That's approximate, and it varies from year to year. Um, so uh, if we were to, to receive, um, say, 500 kits, I'm sorry, 500 cases in, um, I would expect to get somewhere between 50 and 60 kits. Um, but that wouldn't represent a full year. That might represent about a third of a year. Um, so we get uh, probably between a somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 cases in DNA. That, that's been fairly consistent over the last couple of years. Okay. So, sir, um, what do you see as the barriers for, I've heard you say staffing, you need more staffing. Is there anything that you would add to that? Uh, well, the, of course, the primary focus right now is staffing. We have staff that we are training, so that is our focus. Uh, right now, my goal is to have them testing as quickly as possible. And so uh, th that's where I focus. If you look in the future, where would I like to see it go? Uh, I would like to see more staff uh, in other areas of the laboratory, but I would also like to see more staff in the DNA section. Again, it is it will be one of the largest, if not the largest section when our current group of analysts that are training are completed with their training. Um, but again, it, it can be a, a very complex uh, area to work in. You can have a homicide case with hundreds of pieces of evidence. You can have sexual assault cases with tens uh, or, or more pieces of evidence that need to be tested. So. It's not as simple as just going out and grabbing a kit and testing one item and moving on to the next one. Okay, so this is my, really my final question. Um, what is the plan going forward to, um, I understand there are about 300 kits that have been identified where, uh, that is prosecutable. And I'm just wondering what, you know, what your plan is going forward in getting these kits tested and um, uh, funding opportunities. I understand that the uh, SACI grant um, uh, application uh, there's a problem with. So, Two, two questions, I shouldn't do this, but I do it all the time anyway. Two questions. Um, uh, what opportunities are there for future grants and what is the plan for, for getting to those identified 300 kits? Well, I, I should start by saying I'm not actually aware of issues with the SACI grant at this time. Uh, it has been submitted, it's been accepted. Uh, whether or not uh, we are awarded that grant uh, remains to be seen. We won't know until sometime in October. Uh, that is uh, that is when that grant will have been reviewed um, uh, by the federal government and presumably uh, awards approved. Uh, we may or may not receive funding under that grant. It is a competitive grant. Uh, there are opportunities for all jurisdictions to apply for that grant, so and a limited amount of money. So we do feel like we put in a very strong uh, response to that grant. Uh, we believe that uh, the distribution of the funding that we've applied for uh, is, uh, in our opinion, it is the best opportunity to begin to address 
some of these sexual assault kits, uh, the backlog. Um, additionally, we have uh, formula grants which are awarded every year. Uh, we have uh, applied for a formula grant in, uh, uh, for 2018 uh, in our DNA section and a portion of the funding related to that. I, I don't recall the specific number right now, but I'll be happy to provide it uh, if you'd like to follow up. Um, will be dedicated towards outsourcing uh, testing. Uh, that can be addressed use, um, towards uh, sexual assault kit testing or towards homicides, burglaries, robberies. I, I believe until we are able to address the backlog that we're currently dealing with, um, with the sexual assault kits, uh, it would be most appropriate to focus our funds there. Um, and certainly, as we can, begin looking at, at some of the other areas. Okay. Um, so just, just for clarification, you, you keep mentioning backlog, and I keep talking about the 300 identified kits. Are we talking about the same thing? Um, are you talking about the 300 identified kits? Uh, we, are, we are talking about the same kits. Okay, the prioritized, the 300 that were given priority. Those would be the initial ones that are going out. And as a matter of fact, I should point out that we have uh, resources. The FBI has pro provided resources for outsourcing uh, some kits. That's a limited number, um, but we have a group that will be going out at the end of, either at the end of this week or the beginning of next week um, that, uh, that will number somewhere in the, in the area of 25 to 35 um, kits, and, and we would focus that on sexual assault kits. All right. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, also, Mr. President, if, um, if I may, um, the state auditor and his office is here, and I would like to ask them to come down. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Thank you, Commander. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, counselors. And we also have uh, Connie Monahan, who I think you know here from uh, SANE, the Statewide Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners Program, and Sabrina Nyer, who's our Government Accountability Officer and General Counsel. Um, a couple of thoughts in terms of an update of the rape kit uh, or sexual assault kit backlog. As folks know here, you know, we conducted a statewide audit last year and that wrapped up at the end of last year and we're uh, able to present that to uh, folks on this panel and uh, share that with the public in terms of where we're at as a state and also where we're at as a city. And so um, a couple of things that I want to touch on with respect to since then, that was about five months ago, by the way, so just to help put that in perspective. And there's a couple of things I think, you know, firstly, I would just state that the, the numbers are very important, obviously, here. I think we had a good overview of uh, some of the qualitative aspects of the lab and so forth. But I just want to remind folks that, you know, <clears throat> depending on the date of the count, between 3,000 and 4,000 untested kits remain at the Albuquerque lab. So I know we talked about different slices of that backlog in terms of what the FBI might be handling and so forth but just want to remind folks of the actual number. And so when we're talking about the FBI, for example, dealing with maybe 40 kits every 10 months, for those 40 victims, that's obviously very, very important. Um, but in terms of 4,000 kits, you know, it's a long way from actually addressing the bulk of the backlog. Uh, a few other things that I want to share, which I think primarily are, we've seen really two different stories on this issue in the last six months. We've seen the state backlog and the state's action plan with respect to getting rid of that. And we've seen the legislature step up with funding. We have seen a secretary of, uh, Home, or of, of Department of Public Safety who has put together a plan to end the state's backlog in two years. He's identified the who, the how, the what, the when, and he has mapped out all the details that are required to end this backlog, including additional money including grant funding. And I think here locally we've seen some good efforts. We've seen, I think we heard about the 333 plan, something to that effect. We're very encouraged, of course, by one million or so in the budget to go to this issue. 
but there's still no plan to end the backlog. And I think that's really what I want to emphasize. At the end of the day, I get asked this question all the time, what's the plan to end the backlog? I have an answer in Santa Fe, and I have a lot of good ideas and good starts in Albuquerque. We need a plan to end the backlog in Albuquerque. Now, to do that, I think <clears throat> there's been several issues that have been discussed. But look, the vacancies are an issue. Uh, even an interim lab director, I hope you become permanent and so forth. We've got to deal with that. There's some critical folks in the lab that I think are retiring that we need to fill those positions as soon as possible. And we also have a situation where, and I think this is the most important thing, counselor, that you hit on. Our early indications are that the backlog is growing. Now, let's think about that. The backlog is already what it is, and it goes back 30 plus years. It goes back to teenagers, to six-year-olds. It is really, really a huge problem, and the backlog is growing. So that's the situation where we're at today, and I just want to share with you and emphasize the numbers, because these numbers matter, and they're getting bigger, and that's the problem. So hopefully, and I think Connie and Sarita are going to uh, fill in just a few more pieces here, but our plan identified about $7 million to deal with this issue. Now, we know it might take a few years. We understand the complexity, and you know we have this report in terms of the research that we did on this. And we don't want to go do another audit of this. And the great news is we don't really think we need to at the state. Uh, because they've got a good plan in place. And so I would just ask each of you to take up uh, the offer to go visit the labs and also perhaps ask for, let's just see the math. Here's the count. Here's how it's going down. Here's where we're going. It, it is a very numerical exercise in terms of tracking and in terms of accountability. And let me end with this. Uh, accountability here is important. This is a 30-year-plus backlog. So if we're going to keep doing this the same, or if we're going to keep trying harder, it is not going to go away. Don't kid yourselves. We have to have a plan that is different and a plan that articulates how to get rid of the backlog. And until that happens, we're going to be having this discussion every six months. Do you want to add anything, Connie? No, I don't. Uh, everything he said, I agree with. I really do. <laughs> All right, thank you. We, we had allocated about 10 minutes for this. Uh, Mr. About Perry. Two minutes. I think we're about 25 minutes in, 26 <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Minutes. So I, I just think it's important. If I could, excuse yeah, me. Briefly. Thanks. I, I appreciate this, this point. It's important to recognize the city has about 4,000 kits. That's what the state auditor has identified. The state has about 1,500. So I'll, I'll, right from the get-go, we start with about twice as many as, as the state has, considerably more than that. And again, it goes back quite a bit. Our budget includes a million dollar executive recommendation to address the backlogs. We have an RFP right now because we're not the only, we're not the worst in the country. I came down here and showed you the statistics about Memphis having 18,000 backlog, Detroit having all kinds, New York. But the plan is basically to come up with about $3 million to do the backlog. And there's two high speed labs in the United States to do this, so Mark Boyd and Sorensen in Utah. We have an RFP out right now. So the, the, the answer to this problem is nothing more than about $3 million. Now, that's a lot. It's an awful lot. But if we want to get serious about it, we included it in our budget. We put our money where our mouth was. The state, they gave $500,000 in capital. The limitations of that capital was that it could only be used address, for the kits, address the for council, the kit, please, the kits Mr. themselves, Perry. Mr. President, for the kits themselves. So you can't use that money to go out. Additionally, the state grant that went in includes the city's numbers as well. So this is a complex problem. There is a solution to it. Like most government problems, it's a solution that involves resources and funding. The executives put into their recommendation a good start, a down payment on that, and we hope that you will bear that in mind and support it. We will absolutely keep that in consideration during the budget process. So let's move on to our next item. Thank you, Mr. State Auditor, um, and we'll move on to the approval of the journal. Oh, excuse me, I beg your pardon. Adm administration question and answer period. Any questions for the administration, counselors? 
I do have one brief question uh, for Mr. Reardon. We talked about this on the phone. The closure of Third Street adjacent to Civic Plaza is creating an incredible amount of congestion at rush hour. What's the situation with that, Mr. Reardon? Mr. President, the closure of Third Street is required to do the work on Civic Plaza. The, the parking structure underneath it limits the amount of weight of the vehicles that can be on Civic Plaza, so some of those vehicles need to be parked on Third Street. So there will be, it will be closed throughout the summer and being coordinated with, with the Convention Center and, and their businesses and their conventions coming in, sorry. It will be closed so throughout the summer. It will be. Yes, and, so 2nd Street has had some intermittent closures to replace the transit lane that's on there. That, that is getting reopened, so 2nd Street will be open, and 5th uh, and Street. Now, we do have the 50-mile bike loop also coming around in downtown. That will be on Marquette, 5th, Silver, 4th, and Terrace. So there is quite a bit of work going out there. We are coordinating barricading to the extent possible, but there is quite a bit of work going out right now. I, I think that folks who are trying to commute would really appreciate anything that can be done to keep tabs on that and, and minimize the, the delays. Really, really is a quite, we used to call in Puerto Rico a tapong at that time of day, so. Um, all right, thank you. Any other questions, counselors? Uh, Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I also have a question for Mr. Reardon. Uh, now that the weather is warming up, are we going to see our contractors uh, doing more work on the art project uh, after 5 p.m.? Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, the, the issue is not warm weather. They were working through the, through the cold period just as much. The, the, the requirement is that we're in residential areas. We cannot work past certain times. So they are working in all daylight hours, and, but making sure that they stay within the noise ordinance and not working into the late hours where construction traffic would bother residences. And what time is that late hour? Uh, uh, that's either 9 or 10 o'clock. I'd have to verify. Okay, that is. thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll move to approval of the journal. Mr. President, I move approval of the April 3rd journal. There's a motion and a second for approval of the April 3rd journal. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? That passes. We'll move to communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Mr. Vice President. Mr. President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. Second. There's a motion and a second for approval of the letter of introduction. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. We'll move to reports of committees. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, April 10th, and reported out the following items. In the matter of ECs 306 and 308 that received be noted. In the matter of ECs 303, 02, and R185 that they be without recommendation. In the matter of R174 that it do pass. And in the matter of EC 310, 311, and 312 that they be approved. Is there a motion to approve I'll make a the, motion to accept that committee report. There, there's a motion and a second to approve the committee report. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Move to deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to defer R-182 until the May 15th meeting. There's a motion. I'll second uh, that for deferral of R-182 until May 15th. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Any other deferrals or withdrawals? If not, we'll move to the consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Mr. Councilor President, Gibson. Like Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to pull item A, EC 270, off the consent ag agenda. That 270 or 260? I'm sorry, EC 260. Okay, and so that will be pulled from the agenda. Uh, Councilor Davis. I had the same one, thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Mr. Wood. President, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Takes us to the item pulled off the agenda. Councilor Gibson, EC 260. Thank you. Find it. There go. EC 260 is the report on FY17 Goal 2, Objective 14, Analysis of Staffing and Salary for the Fire Alarm Room. Yes, Mr. President, um, thank you. Uh, questions, the staff posed here uh, two questions in the write-up. 
and um, I thought they were worth um, asking at tonight's meeting. Uh, and the first one is why doesn't the city have a consolidation of the police and fire communications center? I was just wondering if anybody is here, if one of the chiefs is here. Councilor Sanchez probably has some perspective on that. Yeah, and, and we can have Chief Downey come down. Uh, this actually was before the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Coordinating Council uh, early on, probably about seven years ago. And the departments tried to look at uh, what the issues were. Um, although there were some bridging opportunities, there were platform issues as well, in what's called interoperability. And council, as uh, President Benton pointed out, Councilor Sanchez heard those issues as, as well as I at length. But I'll turn it over to Chief Downey and maybe tax his memory on the last time we looked at it. Chief. Um, President Benton, I'm sorry, Councilor Gibson, can you ask uh, specifically what the first question is again? Um, why we're not consolidated, is that right? Yeah, between uh, fire and police, why you can't share like space or for, um, for your communication centers. Okay. Um, President Benton and Councilor Gibson, I'm just looking at the question here. Why doesn't the city have a consolidated police fire and EMS communication center? We, we do in that when somebody calls 911 in the city of Albuquerque, um, a civilian with the police department takes the call and then determines whether it's a, a police department call, a fire and EMS call, or both, and sends it to a dispatcher with either agency. So there are police and fire employees in a consolidated center. So I see. So dispatches, there's a fire dispatch and a, and a, a, a police dispatch, correct? Cor cor correct. Okay, the the call taker is a, is a police employee that sends it to either one or both, depending on the nature of the call. So, and is that what was considered seven years ago or so to put the dispatch together? There, fire and, and, and police? I think what the purpose of the question here is in terms of consolidation is there should be, should there be a wall between the police dispatchers and the fire dispatchers as there is currently in the 911 center? There's right. a clear separation. And I would say in order for them to be truly consolidated, the wall shouldn't be there. There should be call takers and there should be dispatchers. Okay, but not consolidated, not sharing space. No, I, Councilor Gibson, I think they should, there should be one, oh. one place. I mean, they're in the same building, but they're clearly divided in what they do. Uh -huh. Now, the county communication center works in, they have all one center, but some of the dispatchers do only law enforcement for the shift. Others might do police and, I'm sorry, fire and EMS for the shift, but they are all sort of cross-trained, if you will. There's no separation between they only do law enforcement and they only do fire like ours is. So you would advocate that the city do something similar? I would advocate that we have a consolidated metropolitan dispatch center based on the way 911 calls come into our area. As Councilor Benton and Councilor Sanchez and I, we've spoken about this at the government commission. Uh -huh. um, there, there is large room for improvement in the way the 911 system works in terms of how calls come into either center and how calls are transferred between centers and whether there could be less duplication of effort, yes. Okay. And I understand you're meeting tomorrow, having a meeting tomorrow on the ninth floor to talk about um, something, I guess, related, but not, not necessarily this topic. But I guess my question is, is this topic part of those conversations? Um, President Benton and Councilor Gibson, th tomorrow's meeting is dis to discuss the resolution that was recently passed to do police fire, county sheriff, a, a complete consolidation of public safety. I, I'm, the 911 should, I believe, should be within the scope of that conversation, but I believe tomorrow's meeting is broader than just 911. Okay. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you, Chief. Uh, Councilor uh, Davis. Well, apologies. Uh, Chief, just very briefly on this actual item uh, for the alarm room study, I know we covered this at FGO. Uh, there are a number of recommendations at the end of the, the study from the administration on how we might do that, including consolidation. But in the immediate sense, since 2005, I think the vacancies have been between four and eight positions that might be necessary to fully staff and respond to the growing number of calls. And you all have had about 100,000 calls now in the last year. Uh, I, I believe, if I recall, of those eight, which is about a 600 and some change thousand uh, recurring fund distribution, <laughs> Could we add at least one to every 
rotation and one driver to every rotation, so maybe four or half of those to, would that aid uh, sort of in the call volume and the workload of the drivers working in the alarm room now? Um, President Benson, Councilors Davis, um, yes, it certainly would. There, it's been more than 10 years since there was an increase in positions in the fire side of the right. 911 center. So two would be ideal, but one would certainly help quite a bit. Great, thank you. <coughs> Councilor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. I was, gonna, I was gonna comment on the current study that I know you all are speaking of tomorrow, and I, I think uh, I think there is some, some, certainly some crossover here because uh, even though it's a wider scope, um, that study, um, you know, could be the scope of that could could really, you know, help us with uh, you know how we can how we can get to this objective right here, and maybe that's where it stops. But I think um, uh, if we, if this is how far we get, I think it'd be well worth it. Um, and I and I want to thank you, Chief, for the the opportunity to, to set up, uh, you know, a tour of the alarm room. It was fascinating. Um, I, I have a great amount of respect for, uh, uh, for, you know what the what they do in that uh, in that center is pretty amazing, and I, I would encourage uh, you know certainly other counselors. I know others have seen it too, but um, just seeing that wall and, and certainly see some way, seeing some ways, and certainly hearing from hearing from uh, um, you know our, our department there and, and how they might be able to work together, um, how there might be some more uh, you know partnerships there. But there already is. I was impressed by the. You know how there is a you know a good system, and certainly there's more ways that we can be more efficient, maybe. And uh, I think it's always it's always good to be you know looking at how we can do that. But above all, just the incredible amount of respect for our, our firefighters who deal with some of the uh, the most difficult things that you could possibly imagine, and all that they handle all at one time is pretty incredible. Um, would you would you comment just real quickly on just the the actual? And I know I know you address a little bit of it, but on on this specific analysis. Of the uh, um, of what the needs are specifically in that alarm room when it comes to uh, the employees there. Uh, certainly, um, President Benton and Councillor Lewis, what we what we were asked to look for really was the, the a staffing comparison between other metropolitan centers. So, in in if I can look at the report real quickly, we reached out to Denver, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and El Paso to see exactly how they operate their 911 centers. We were the only standalone fire dispatch center of all those larger metropolitan areas. There was some form of consolidation, and either that was police and fire together in one center for that particular jurisdiction, or they were multiple fire and EMS, for example, they would do a city and a county. So we, we stood alone as the only standalone fire and EMS dispatch center. That was one, one large difference. Um, this would be a very contentious issue, uniform dispatchers versus civilian dispatchers. Um, we were the only ones that were continuously uniform dispatchers. The salary comparison, we were very competitive salary-wise. The big deficiency that was based on our call volume, the staffing level was dramatically lower than most centers our size or larger. And just a quick, a quick uh, follow-on. Um, when we looked at this uh, several years back at the, at the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission, it was before Chief Downey's time, but at that time, both fire chiefs were strongly in favor of, of consolidation, but uh, for whatever reason, higher ups at the county uh, 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 kind of put the kibosh on that at, at that time, but, it, but it, it, at that time, there was strong support from, from both chiefs uh, uh, to, to, you know, seriously move towards that. So uh, something I know that Councilor Sanchez and I share as being a, a long-term goal, regardless of what comes out of the rest of the consolidation uh, study. So, thank you, Chief. Sure. I'll move to receipt be noted on EC 260. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, that passes. We'll move to general public comment. There'll be a two-minute time limit. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half, then a bell will ring and the light will turn yellow, indicating you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comments at two minutes. The light will turn red and ring to indicate that your time is up. Uh, we'll be calling the, the, the next three names, so when you hear your name, come on down and sit in the front so we can move on through the list. But we'll start with Jonathan Siegel, followed by Don Schrader, and then Anthony Garcia. Thank you, good evening. I simply came down to thank you all for your service 
and for your outstanding ways of working together. It is notable, it is seen by many of us, and it's really appreciated. And I just thought it needed to be said. Uh, I would extend that as well, my thanks and gratitude to administration and to all the city workers who are so often not noticed, but really get out there day after day and do their jobs too, from the 311 call center to the 242 cops and the 911 center, and on down to every department where I go. I find people who are ready and willing to help. Now, sometimes they don't say everything that I wished they had said, but they say it with clarity and they say it with a decency. And I want to thank you for running a good government. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Siegel, and thanks for all your volunteerism over the year. <laughs> Mr. Siegel, as, as, as many of you know, is, has, uh, has really, as far as I know, been a lifelong volunteer with the city of Albuquerque, and it's very much appreciated. Uh, Don Schrader, Anthony Garcia, and then Alan Reed will speak. When would it be right for another nation to murder our children? If never, how can it be right to murder their children? How much good is it to pray, hope, protest for peace if we pay tax for war? If your tax dollars burned homes and killed families on your street, would you pay? Are neighbors abroad less human, less precious than neighbors on our street? I oppose all war. So for me to pay federal income tax, to train largely people of color and of lower income to become professional hired killers, to murder on command with no conscience, would be more evil more evil than being a soldier myself. I have paid no federal income tax for 38 years. Almost half of federal income tax pays for U.S. wars, past, present, and future. I refuse to pay for the U.S. to murder moms, dads, and kids in many nations. Monday, May 1st, from 4 to 7 p.m. in Tigway Park near Old Town, a public rally in support of our immigrant sisters and brothers. I know that Monday, May 1st is the next city council meeting, but I aim to be at the rally to support immigrants. Please, sir, no applause. Uh, Anthony Garcia, followed by Alan Reed, then Simon Polakowski. Yes, I am Anthony Garcia. We have all been taught lies since we were children. We're not even a country. We are a corporation, and you guys are all doing fraud, okay? I am Anthony Garcia, representing the people to enforce human rights worldwide. I want to applaud the city council for destroying public access. Sold public access five years ago for $117,000 more a year, a contract to you public to not let no one on public access. This was planned from the city council. All the people that were already on public access were no longer allowed to have a TV show, no more. This public access is paid from the, from the people on cable TV. I did the electrical for the lights in the studio for free because I used to have a show once a week from 2004 to 2012. I am a contractor. I work all over New Mexico. I, I would travel from Carlsbad, New Mexico once a week to make sure I did my show. Then after my show, I would travel back to Carlsbad to go to work. I did this for eight months. Now the public access building on 6th and Central, doors are always locked. It looks abandoned. <clears throat> no one, never there, have, um, has signs, no one has signs, people, uh, you public would have signs, they would train people, they would go out in the streets and help people. Since, since you guys destroyed public access, 
My family was destroyed. You guys know who I am. And I am going to be killed by my government. And I'm going to continue to expose the lies. And I have discovered we're all being lied to. We are all humans. And I just discovered America is the new, the enforcers of the new world order. And it is through unlawful laws. We can change this. And how we can change this is through enforcing human rights. For all people can have life, family, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you, sir. Yeah. But Nick, everything's lies. Your time is up, sir. Know. Your time is up. We already Thank you. know. It's going to end. Alan right? Reed, followed it's by Simon end. Polakowski, followed by John Gallegos. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Mr. President and counselors. Uh, for about six months, the Open Space Advisory Board has been working very intensely with Superintendent uh, Vasquez with the National Park Service, with uh, Director Barbara Taylor from Parks and Rec Department, uh, the Open Space Division staff, uh, community experts such as Isaac Eastfold, who was the original uh, organizer of Friends of the Albuquerque Petroglyphs that led to the national legislation that established the monument. We had some f serious problems, obviously deficiencies, uh, some of which we've already addressed and you have already addressed. I'm here to say that the board urges you to approve uh, R-171, uh, sponsored by Councilor Benton, uh, which is on your agenda this evening. That represents the focus of all this work that's gone on in this past six or eight months. And it is the structure in which we can proceed finally to identify what needs to be done between the city, the park service, and the monument, and to put the resources together to take care of it better in the future. And uh, you know, in 2005, uh, the open space division was stripped of 20 open space rangers. So we don't have the people to cover the monument the way we should. And there are other problems addressed very well in, uh, in this uh, legislation, R-171. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thanks for your service on the Open Space Board. Simon Polakowski, followed by John Gallegos, and then El Emily Ashby. Uh, good evening, Councilors, Council President, and Council. Uh, I represent no one but myself. I speak for no one but myself. Uh, what Mr. Uh, Garcia, Anthony Garcia, said beforehand is true. He did wire, he did volunteer. In fact, there are many other people like Mr. Garcia who did offer their time. Uh, maybe they didn't have the money, so they offered, they helped move uh, public access when it had to leave the former district courthouse to set the central location. Uh, there were people with all sorts of programs, religious, political, uh, health, you name it. It was a whole kaleidoscope of different people, ordinary people like Mr. Garcia and myself, where we weren't professionals. We were just everyday people who wanted to get something across to the public. And, you know, this was, you know, our chance. And, you know, now we have two minutes. Uh, most, I mean, I don't want to be down. I, I would rather be on public access. I didn't bother with city council. I wanted to do something else. But I've been forced here and I can, will continue on coming here. And I really do believe that uh, uh, the present uh, management, you public, I went and spoke with them when they first came in and I was told by somebody, I will decide what is you know, presentable on public access. And I thought, you know, this is censorship. The whole idea behind public access is that any one of us and all of us can go there. And I think that's a crime, that this is no longer a, you know, this is a violation of our First Amendment rights. This is what not, it was not intended for. It was intended for the average person, the amateur, not the professional. We, he's an electrician. I do construction. We have other jobs that we profess, you know, professionalism. We wanted to do, you know, you have a podium. I saw one of the people that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polakowski, and uh, I'll just say that I, can only speak for myself, but but um, that contract of you public is going to be up, 
And um, I think we're going to have a different kind of process when we look at that again. Uh, Councillor Harris. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, Mr. Polakowski. Yeah, that, uh, the, the way that contract has been administered is, is un, it makes a lot of councillors unhappy. Um, it, the contract is coming up here soon. And I know that a lot of councillors are talking about actually fully staffing the, the, the cable board. So that's going to happen here shortly also. All right. Thank you. Uh, next is John Gallegos, followed by Emily Ashby and then Pablo Reyes. Thank you. Thank you, City Councilors and President Benton. My name is John Gallegos. I'm with NAOP, the Vice President. I'm speaking on behalf of the NAOP Board, who voted unanimously on uh, April 11th at the Board meeting in support of the dilapidated uh, building ordinance, 1734. Uh, they believe this will accomplish the goals of focusing on the unsafe, neglected, and decaying commercial buildings in our city while not penalizing law-abiding good landlords and, and owners. The board wanted, wanted to quickly thank Councilor Harris, Council, uh, Councilor Davis, and Councilor Jones, and other councilors for working with, with the industry long and hard over the scope and the wording of this, of this bill. As Albuquerque residents and landowners, we have no interest in protecting those buildings that create nuisances and, sa and safety hazards. Uh, we don't, however, want to create a regulation that will make doing business in our business more expensive and more burdensome. We believe this new bill will accomplish this and will provide new tools for addressing the problems and the lacks of lawlessness, landlords, and owners. Thank you again. Appreciate your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Gallegos. Ms. Ashby, followed by Mr. Reyes, and then Tad Nemeski. Hello, Mr. President. Hello, Mr. Vice President, and hello, counselors. I hope you're having a good evening. My name is Emily Ashby. I'm a senior at Sandia High School, and I swim for the swim team there. Well, I'm graduating in a month, but I used to. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Jackie Matsko. She went to Sandia last year, and Betsy Patterson was like a mother figure to her. So these are her words. Betsy Patterson was a mother figure to me my entire life. She nannied me every Wednesday, a day of the week I was always excited for. I spend a lot of my time as a young girl following Betsy on Sandia's pool deck. Chris Baker has memories of me following Betsy when he had some practice with her when I was as tall as he is now. And prom I promise these are Jackie words, not mine. It wasn't until I accidentally fell in the pool and Betsy had to pull me out of the water because I couldn't swim on my own. That's when she told my mom, she's on swim team now. From then on, I swam every day. She was the reason swimming became a huge part of my life. I strive every day to be like her, her humor, selflessness, strength, and not caring what anyone thought about her. And that's what I admired about her most. I remember hearing during her chemotherapy, she still showed up at the pool almost every day and never let anyone see her in pain. She was the strongest woman and role model any person could ever have. Needless to say, losing Betsy rocked my world as well as the entire swimming community. It is the greatest honor for Sandia's pool to be named after her, for it was the pool where she touched endless hearts and showed everyone how to be Betsy Strong. What Jackie has says has entailed the heart, love, and spirit that Betsy radiated through her family, friends, and swimmers. Passing Bill R-17-188 to change the name of Sandia Pool to Betsy Patterson Pool would be a great way to exemplify and honor the service and compassion that Betsy gave to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Pablo Reyes is next, followed by Tad Nemiski, then Lauren Hines. Justice Antonis Scalia Bar Memorial, U.S. Supreme Court Practice, Ya Viene Lagua City Council, Matthew Banner, Civil Recall, the source. And warning, City Council, you're going to need a copyright license for the presentation. You need to duplicate right here by Pablo Reyes. Today we are here to settle with the city. Pablo Reyes under extreme pressure to pay has to settle with the city of Albuquerque. Reyes under extreme pressure to pay applied for a job as a policeman with the city on or about April 2017. Mayor on no November 2016 approximately with city of Albuquerque clerk Natalie Howard. On April 17, 2017 approximately Pablo Reyes under extreme pressure to pay talked with Trina deputy City Clerk and Natalie Howard about a collect due process and a tax levy with city personnel, not yet mentioned, a settlement with the city. Pablo Reyes, under extreme pressure to pay, told Natalie Howard about signing with the city clerk for City Council District 3, 
Since Pablo Reyes under extreme pressure to pay talk with Howard about signing with the city clerk for mayor of the city of Albuquerque aforesaid, paragraph one, and the aforesaid settlement with the city over 26 U.S.C. 7201 tax division and New Mexico state charges not yet mentioned. I'd appreciate help with an elected position as write-in mayor or write-in city councilor since nobody has fixed any problems these past eight years. In a U.S. Supreme Court case 107746, we call a sprawling criminal tax lawsuit. I'll be back to prove it might be of good help as a city councilor or mayor of the city of Albuquerque. I'd appreciate a response, city council, before my mom Soledad Reyes passes away, paying all household bills by herself at Los Reyes Firewood Small Business Office here in the city of Albuquerque. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Nemiski, followed by Mr. Hines, and then John Garcia. Thank you. My name is Ted Nemiski. Well, I have a question to Council Benton. All the heck is going on on the Tejeras and 6th Street that been dug out already for about five, six months, and hardly anyone during the day working, most of the time, 80% of the days. Now, Broadway and Central, almost one year already. That's not only one way, each direction on Central, Broadway, for the, uh, once, uh, look at this backup, all the way to Lomas, most of the time, and then to Co. That's not fun, uh, driving. I have to go all the way around to avoid uh, this intersection. And uh, to downtown or otherwise, way far you did. So anyway, let's go to talk a little bit about UNMCNM, APS, shortfall, crisis. Well, we have, we have right here teacher, princip excuse me, teacher, assistant principal, principal, CEO, and superintendent. Maybe he can, answer this question. Why this short Paul? He's such genius. I know he's just flip flopper at city council meeting. Time, get out from here. And most of you too. Thank you. Next is uh, Lauren Hines, followed by John Garcia, and then Ike Eastfold. Uh, President Benton, members of the council. Uh, my name's Lauren Hines. I'm the current chair of the Open Space Advisory Board. I'd like to reiterate what uh, Mr. Reed said earlier. Uh, division, uh, open Space Division staff, Park Service uh, staff have been working diligently to come up with a visitor use plan for the monument. Uh, the advisory board has provided guidance and uh, also worked with the Park Service. And we have uh, supported uh, this visitor use management plan to help uh, protect, preserve, and, uh, and basically reestablish uh, some of the vegetation on top and on the bottom of the escarpment. Uh, this, this property was acquired, the volcanoes, by the city back in the 70s. Uh, the monument was created in 1990. We, along with the state and the federal government, acquired, have acquired most of the property with inside the monument. We now need to uh, take next step, which is taking the effort, making the effort to protect what we have uh, committed to protect. And so I'm here to urge your support of R17-171. It is uh, the first step that we'll be coming back with, uh, with a visitor use management plan uh, that we hope you will also support. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hines, and thanks for your volunteerism and leadership on the board. Mr. Garcia, followed by Ike Eastfold. Uh, Mr. President, members of the council, my name is John Garcia, Executive Vice President, Home Builders Association of Central New Mexico. In regards to uh, O-1740, adopting uniform admi administrative code for buildings, 
Um, the state has adopted the 2015 code, but they are yet to adopt the 2015 energy code. Tonight's proposed amendment to adopt the 2015 energy code along with the 2015 code without any public discussion between the department, the industry, and the council, we feel is premature. So with all due respect, Mr. President, we ask that you defer this amendment to start the process to adopt the 2015 energy code until there is communication on the 2015 energy code. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is, uh, and last speaker is Ike Eastfold. Uh, President uh, Benton and members of the council, I brought along with me today copies of a poster we made to lobby for creation of the National Monument, the Endangered Images poster, and I mounted uh, copies of the front of that for all of you. Uh, have you received that? Um, that is a Xerox there of the back, which I didn't think would be of interest to you in mounting it. Um, the, the mounted copies? What? Oh, okay. Uh, they, they will be passed out. Um, I, I certainly want to uh, honor all the people that have worked on this monument and trying to get it back on track. Most recently, uh, you have an excellent open space advisory board. I'm very fortunate to have four former city councilor, Alan Reed, working tirelessly on this, and an excellent chairman. Um, Lauren, who just addressed you. Uh, it's, it's a very, very good body, and uh, I'm glad they're doing good work. There are many others uh, equally important and not heard about too much that are in the Pueblo Indian community. And I'm sad to tell you that one of the greatest leaders, Herman Agoyo of OK Owinje Pueblo, passed away on April 9th. Um, he was one of the three Pueblo elders who led the effort to create Petroglyph National Monument, was chairman of the All Indian Pueblo Council from 1986 to 1990, the formative period leading up to designation of the monument. Uh, I knew Herman as a friend. We hiked many areas of the monument together and went to Washington, D.C. together. He passed away uh, quietly in his sleep on April 9th at the uh, Laguna Elder Care uh, facility. And I'm here to honor his memory. Thank you, Mr. Eastfall, and thanks for pointing out uh, the contributions of Mr. Agoyo. Uh, Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just want to personally say thank you to you for your extraordinary work in the preservation of the Petroglyph Monument. I know you've been working on this for decades and you continue to stand tall as one of the leaders in our community to assure that we continue to preserve and protect the National Monument. So thank you very much, Ike. Ditto on that. Thanks, Ike. Did, did you all get the mounted copies? Yes, I'd like those passed out. Uh -huh. I, I mounted these copies and hope, hope that they will show up on some of the walls of the city council chambers uh, to remind you um, permanently of what uh, Herman Agoyo did. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Eastfall. Very much appreciated. And we'll, I'm sure, enjoy having those in our, in our council office. That concludes the general public comment. <clears throat> and we'll move now to announcements. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority meeting on Wednesday, April 19th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Grego Chambers. And Councillor Benton, that's me. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission meeting on Tuesday, April 18th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. We have no public hearings tonight. We'll move on to approvals. EC uh, 307, Mayor's recommendation of Smith Engineering Company for the Marble Arno storm drainage design. I move approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. I do have some questions for uh, the department on this. Uh, this was on consent, but uh, 
but I had a few questions. I did review the proposal, the, the uh, professional services proposal of uh, Smith Engineering for this project. <clears throat> and um, they, of course, have some uh, history with the project, which is a, a good reason to select them for this work. Um, but in reading and, and talking about that, um, and, and reading their narrative of their experience, um, it was pointed out that the uh, that the uh, Marble Arno uh, pond, which is is down adjacent to uh, to the pump station, the existing pump station, which includes some pumps that were uh, bought. Uh, surplus by the city of Albuquerque in the 1950s and we've managed to keep those pumps running somehow I think I feel like we're my joke is we're like a Cuban auto mechanic uh, making our own parts and, and keeping these these pumps working but um, the the question I had I've had some discussions with the MAFC on this uh, the big question is um, whether or not because the narrative implied that it would be that the new pond would be shallower than the original concept. In other words, the original concept had a wet well 30 feet deep, um, and, and the, uh, this describes a, a, a pond of 18 feet deep. So could you clarify that, Ms. Lazoya? Council President Benton, I can answer that question for you. So we do have funding that AMAFCA provided in the amount of $6 million, and we have an existing amount about $3.9 million which is roughly about $10 million. Based on that amount and in conjunction with our consultant, we're looking at scoping the project to incorporate as much of the ultimate uh, project as we can, meaning the facade. We're looking at trying to make the pond as deep as we can, you know, perhaps 25 to 30 feet deep. I think the ultimate depth is 30 feet deep. Um, that's gonna just depend on funding. Obviously, the neighborhood is, is looking for a nicer facade to go around the facility as well as some plantings and things like that. So all that has to be taken into consideration uh, based on the funding that we have. Uh, and that will be done through the process with the engineer to look and see what we can actually accomplish with the funding we have now. And uh, speaking of that funding, I did have a conversation with the uh, with one of the, the members of the AMAFCA board and the AMAFCA engineer and they expressed, uh, without without making a commitment, but they expressed an interest in in, in discussing with them, possibly uh, making a financial arrangement with them where they could front the money on this, and we would pay them back to do the complete project. Is that something that you've had any discussions with them about? Uh, Council President Benton, I have not at this point in time. I did not know that was an offer on the table from AMAFCA, but certainly something that we can look into. Um, ultimately, the desire is to relocate the existing Broadway pump station to this site. Right. Um, the price tag on that is, you know, anywhere from 25 to 30 million, depending on who you ask. If, I think AMAFCA moved forward with talking with TLC, and they were estimating 40 million. So obviously, if AMAFCA is wanting to participate, mm -hmm. that's something we can definitely discuss. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, this is not a commitment of their board. This is a, a casual conversation about how we might just cut, complete this project once and for all. We all know the history of, of the flooding that's occurred there, and we appreciate the partnership of AMAFCA, of course, with the temporary pond and their, their commitments to uh, some of the preliminary design work that was done. Um, so I just wanted to bring that out as, as something that we ought to be discussing in terms of long-term funding. I'm the biggest advocate of phased construction when you don't have the funding. I, I, you know, it's always smart to try to get projects moving and, and to phase them, but I, I, I am a little bit concerned that, that uh, um, in this case, that, that if, if at all possible, we ought to try to get the whole package done. Um, and, and looking at, at our capital improvement uh, program, looking out in the out years, it might be something that would be worth panning out. Um, presently, I know that there's not funding for, for the whole project, but uh, I wanted to reiterate the importance of the, of the building facade, at least on part of it, of the site, to, to uh, pre present a better frontage to the neighborhood. Um, 
I wanted to ask about the Central and, and Walter project because when you presented to the East Downtown Board uh, or answered questions really, it wasn't really a presentation, but I think you were answering their questions about that site. You indicated that that, um, that that site at Walter and Central could not be alleviated by the Arno Marble Pond and that it, that it was not really in the same basin. Whereas my discussions again with the MAFCA indicated that, that a full build out of the Marble Ar Arno Pond might easily obviate the need for the, the Central and Walter proposed facility. Uh, Council President Benton, I, I beg to differ with the MAFCA on that, but I would definitely want to sit down and talk to them about that. The two areas have two separate drainage basins. Um, the central drainage basin, as mm -hmm. you know, goes to the underpass under central and then is pumped into the Tejeras pump station and then further on down the line. The drainage that comes to Lomas Broadway intersection or the pond there uh, is actually pumped up to the North Diversion Channel. So they're two separate drainage basins, but I'll definitely talk with the MAFCA on, on what their thoughts are behind and, that. And, and yeah, I, I, I really just think it's, it's probably time to kind of circle back with them, especially before Wilson gets going on, on uh, this design and, and try to see where we are. And, and I also just, without purporting to understand it all myself, I certainly want to support it in terms of our, our, uh, our capital program that, that we could try to get this tackled. And just speaking one, one more thing on that. Um, <clears throat> We've been asking about this one item in the, act, the activity number for the South Broadway Master Plan Drainage Improvements. <clears throat> there are unidentified encumbrances in the amount of about $950,000. And I was trying to, we've been trying to figure out what that encumbrance was. And we know that there was another approximately million dollar encumbrance to purchase the site a few years back. This is separate from that. Do you know what that? that uh, encumbrance is from the uh, 2015 Master Drainage Improvement Plan? Uh, Council President Benton, I do not have the specifics on that, but I do know that the South Broadway uh, drainage plan that was done called for several improvements in millions of dollars. Right. I would suspect that we're looking at various locations for additional uh, pond capacity, but I can get that information back to you. Okay. Yeah, and we were just trying to piece together all of over the years, right, this is going back to 2006, really, when we first tried to tackle this. So just trying to understand where we are, we are in total on that. So uh, any way we can help with that, facilitating those meetings. But, but I would encourage that it, that it would be time to regroup with the MAFCA and talk about possible future means by which we could fund the whole thing and get it done. So. Council President Benton, I'd just like to say that you know we understand your concern and the desire to have improvements in this area. Over the years since 2006, we have spent 25 to 30 million, and we continue to program funds out into the future. Uh, South Broadway has about 16.5 million program between now and 2025. So we understand that it's a, it's important, and we continue to program funds. All right, thank you, Ms. Lozoya. Um, so. Uh, I move, I move approval of EC 307. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? And that passes. Uh, we'll move on to final actions. Councillor Gibson, R188. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, R188 is a renaming of the existing Sandia swimming pool as the Betsy Patterson pool in honor of her distinguished service to the students of Sandia High School and children of the city of Albuquerque. I'm going to move a due pass on this. And I think we have some people who've signed up. We do have one person sign up to speak, Chris Baker. Good evening. Good evening, President Benton, Vice President Winter, Council, Council Gibson. Um, I'm gonna try my best. It's very hard to really summarize what kind of a person Betsy Patterson was, but 
Uh, I'll definitely try my best. <clears throat> Hazel Elizabeth Hall Patterson, or Coach Betsy as we called her, spent around a quarter century here in Albuquerque coaching and teaching swimming to thousands of children and adolescents. She would coach in her backyard pool during most mornings and then make her way down the street to the Sandia High School pool to coach the Sandia High School swim team and club team there. No matter what skill set, Betsy would work hard to cater to every swimmer's needs in order to teach them how to swim. She was an exceptional woman, coach, mentor, and friend. Betsy was first diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2004. She would often ride her bike to the uh, to and from chemotherapy 20 and 30 mile round trips. She was the epitome of strength and did not allow the cancer to change her way of life. The cancer had gone away until 2013 when it returned and was found in her liver. After her second diagnosis, Betsy continued to fight and not let cancer defeat her. She battled long enough to see her daughter Ashley open up the Fish Factory Swim School in the Heights, a longtime family dream, as well as to see her younger daughter Jennifer's wedding before passing away in August of 2014. I thank you for your time and consideration to officially name the, rename the Sandy High School Pool the Betsy Hat Patterson Pool in honor of her distinguished service to the students of Sandy High School and the children of the city of Albuquerque. Betsy's daughter Ashley has raised the funds to have the lettering paid for at the pool. She is dearly missed and this renaming will help to keep her legacy going and is an incredible honor for such an incredible human being. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Is there any other discussion? Councillor Harris. Yeah, sometimes it, it occurs to me that perhaps we should explain things if people happen to be watching this on TV, that the city of Albuquerque actually builds the pools for APS and we uh, actually administer them. And I, I was just wondering if people were watching this thing, why are we naming a pool at Sandia High School? But that's because it's actually the city facility. That's right. We also have uh, pools at uh, Valley and uh, Highland. Councillor Jones. Thank you for mentioning that, uh, Councillor Harris. I got an email from a constituent wondering why in the world we were changing the name of Sandia High. It seems that uh, the news had reported that the city council was changing the name of Sandia High School. So uh, this is how gossip gets all mixed up. So we do have the right to change the pools and I think this is an appropriate thing to do. So thank you. Councilor Gibson to close. Thank you, Mr. President. So I've heard quite a bit about um, Ms. Patterson in the past month or so and really I wish I, I had the chance to meet her because she certainly, certainly sounded like a really wonderful woman and someone who's really committed and loved what she did. So I think this is a great idea, renaming the Sandia High School pool, and I urge your support. There's a motion and a second for a due pass on R-188. Any other discussion? All those in favor, say yes. yes. Opposed? And that passes. Councilor Winter, 028. Thank you, Mr. President. 028 is revising portions of the traffic code section 8-5-1-5 relating to meter parking, expired meter parking, Revising Section 8-1-3-99B relating to penalties for parking violations. I move it due pass. There's a motion and a second for due pass. And uh, Mr. President, I think that there is an amendment. Mr. President. Uh, Councilor. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll move this amendment. Just on, uh, I'll call this amendment number one. And this uh, requires that the Department of Municipal Development every two years evaluate the standards in this ordinance because what happened before is that as uh, vehicles kept getting, their baseline kept getting better in terms of uh, their emissions, um, almost any vehicle would uh, qualify as a green vehicle after uh, a decade or two. So this would enable us to, to continue um, monitoring this and, uh, and working uh, with the standards uh, as they uh, improve over time. So I, I move. Uh, Format member number one, and here's what it says. B, this program shall be evaluated by the Department of Municipal Development every two years. This evaluation will be brought before the City Council with recommendations of alteration to the green vehicle program as necessary. And that's on page two following line 12. There's a motion and a second for amendment number one. Councilor Winter. Yeah, I was just gonna second the amendment. Okay, okay. And uh, any discussion on the amendment? 
Mr. President, if I may, I think that relates to the green vehicle program that we haven't necessarily discussed yet, uh, but I think it's, we can, if it's right, we can still include it here because uh, <clears throat> I think we're going to assume we're going to re replace the green vehicle program, but it technically amends and mentions a program I think that's not in the bill at the moment. Is that right? Well, okay. I'm getting a weird look from staff, so. Okay. Okay. All right. in the bill? It's okay, then. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Just okay. check. Okay. All right. There's a motion and a second for amendment number one to 028. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? That passes. Aye. And uh, back on the bill, uh, Councillor Davis. Mr. President, I have two other amendments. They're both very brief if you want to do them before public comment, if you'd like. Uh, I'd like to offer what will now be, I'm sorry, committee amendment number two has already been offered. Is that right? Mr. President, I'm, I'm afraid I may have confused the issue here a little bit. Uh, Councillor Davis, you're exactly right. right. The, the uh, green vehicle amendment is next. Uh, but I believe Councillor Harris's amendment is still in order if this passes. Okay. So, uh, Councillor Davis. Thanks. Mr. President, I'd like to move committee amendment or uh, floor amendment number two on this case and we'll return with related to green vehicles to keep us moving in that direction. Uh, essentially what this does, this amendment is published already in the packets and available for public review. Initially, this resolution uh, proposed to remove the city's green vehicle program uh, it, in fact, it was already removed um, because over the 10 years or so that the program was in place, vehicle standards far exceeded the expectation that was set originally. And so we ended up with a number of uh, SUVs and sort of gas guzzling vehicles now that qualified under a very old standard. Uh, originally, the proposal was to remove the green vehicle guide, a uh, green vehicle standard, but this proposes to replace it with a higher standard so that only a few of the most uh, efficient vehicles uh, qualify. It restores the original purpose of the program. Uh, we can get into it. I know Ms. Uh, Ms. Schultz is available to answer some questions if we need it. Uh, but in lieu of reading this three or four page piece, let me just move committee member number two that's in the packet that replaces our green vehicle program with newer, higher standards uh, that are outlined in the amendment and attached. I'll second that amendment. There's a motion and a second for uh, amendment number two. Mr. Zaman. Mr. President, I do apologize. I. Uh, confused myself as well earlier. Councillor uh, Davis, the amendment that, that you just read mm -hmm. was actually adopted and it adopt should be and is actually a part Great. of the bill that's before the council. Great. So that uh, the only amendment that's necessary related to green vehicles was the one that Councillor Harris offered. Thanks for that clarification. And I apologize. I for thought we did, it, but I couldn't remember if we passed it or just talked about it. So thanks for that clarification. Okay. So there's, there's uh, amendment number two been withdrawn. Um, and so we're back on the bill. Council Winter to close. Oh, actually, we do have a, a person signed up to speak. Um, or do we have anyone signed up to speak on 028? I don't see anyone. Okay. We so there is my. All right. Council Winter. Okay, Mr. President, I heard your support. There's a motion and a second. We're due pass on 028. Uh, as amended, all those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Mr. And President, will, uh, I want to point Harris. out, uh, we, we all got an email from a gentleman who happens to live in my district about the parking for motorcycles. Motorcycle. And uh, I don't think what people realize is that uh, Councillor Davis actually passed a very helpful amendment on that issue at committee. And I don't think uh, people who search bills might not realize how to get to that one. So we actually did uh, do some helpful things with regard to motorcycle parking in this bill. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. So we're going to take a dinner break. We'll be back in a half an hour. <laughs>